Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. On a frosty February day, the caretaker Brody stepped out into the yard to clear the snow. He was muttering something to himself, either humming a tune or talking to himself. The children ran around, playing, jumping in the snowdrifts, undoing the work the man was diligently doing. Come on, go play on the playground, or I'll catch you and give you a scolding, Brody threatened. You run around here, don't let me clean up properly. And sooner or later, the manager will come. Who will get in trouble for not clearing the snow? Of course, Mr. Garcia. Brody Garcia grumbled like an old man, but the children paid him no mind. They weren't afraid of him at all and therefore didn't listen. Mr. Garcia loved children, although he never had his own. Over the years of working in the orphanage, he became deeply attached to each new child, and when they graduated from the institution, tears welled up in the man's eyes. He remembered each of them as children he had helped zip up jackets, put on boots, tie scarves when they were going out for a walk. Often, the children's caregivers asked him to keep an eye on them. Where are your shovels? Brody commanded. Take them and come with me to clear the snow. Look what you've done. The children, racing each other, hurried to the storage closet on the veranda where the tools were kept. Taking shovels, they began to throw snow with Mr. Garcia from the paths into the snowdrifts. Together, they tidied up almost the entire area. You're doing great, Brody, praised the childcare worker. You're doing well with the kids, you made them work, and there are no complaints. It's a pity you don't have your own, you would have raised good children and grandchildren. Was there really no one to have children with in your youth? Brody's youth was wild. He had been with so many girls, he wouldn't have enough fingers to count them all. But he never thought about serious relationships. He was a prominent guy, and girls chased after him in droves. And he, so to speak, used them and left without regret. In his younger years, Brody was into motorcycles, often participated in races, competed with other guys on challenging tracks. He crashed during one of those races. He spent a whole year in the hospital. Doctors literally pieced his bones together, and a special apparatus was installed on his right leg. Later, it turned out that the bones had healed incorrectly, they were broken again and reassembled. Complex surgeries exhausted him, and the realization that he would have to give up motorcycle racing caused severe depression. He was rescued from apathy towards everything around him by a young nurse. So what if you have problems with your leg, she comforted the young, handsome guy. The main thing is you're alive, be glad that we have a surgeon sent from God, others would have long put a cross on you. The girl in the white coat with blue eyes and long blonde hair became his solace. He waited every time for her shift to start, and she would enter the room to bring medicine to the patient. Sometimes Liana treated him to homemade pastries. Here, help yourself, my grandma made them, and there's too much for us to eat together, she offered Brody the rosy pies. I bet you missed home-cooked food. And he happily ate the pies. Your grandma is a culinary goddess, Liana, praised the guy. It's delicious. Mmm. When Brody was allowed to go outside with crutches, Liana sometimes went for a walk with him in the hospital garden. They sat on a bench and talked. Liana was preparing to enter medical school and wanted to become a pediatrician. So you love children, Brody asked. Yes, how can you not love them? Liana replied. The guy didn't understand Liana's enthusiasm for children. Children didn't interest him at all, to Brody, they were akin to aliens, beings that were very difficult to understand. He found tinkering with machinery much more interesting. That was his calling, he believed. During the year spent in the hospital, Liana became very close to him, almost like family. Sometimes it seemed to him that he was drowning in her blue eyes. At such moments, Brody wanted to grab the girl, hold her in his strong arms, kiss her lips, as he did with other girls. But Liana was different, it wasn't possible with her, and the guy felt it. So, he just looked at her and admired her beauty. Here, came to say, goodbye, Liana said once, entering Brody's room. Leaving, going to take the entrance exams at the university. Leaving already? 
Despite knowing about the nurse's intention to enter university, this news was unexpected for him. Already? Yes, it's time, the girl took his hand, you get better, everything will be okay. Memories of long ago flooded the orphanage caretaker. He stood, leaning on the shovel handle, momentarily disconnected from what was happening in the yard. Suddenly, Mr. Garcia heard a shout. Uncle Brody, Uncle Brody, come here quickly, Martin Adams called. What else happened, the caretaker startled. Hurry, there's someone freezing here, the boy shouted. Mr. Garcia followed towards the gate, where Martin was waving his hands. The boys were so engrossed that they had already managed to clear the snow over the entire area and had approached the gates. Opening the wicket, they stared with surprise at the snowdrift. Almost completely buried in the snow, frozen, seeming lifeless, sat a little boy. He held a plush dog in his hands. Run, call the child care worker, Mr. Garcia urged the boys. The boys ran to the orphanage building shouting for help. The caretaker picked up the child, shaking off the snow from his coat, and carried him along the path. In the foyer, they undressed the child. Caregivers and a medic rushed to their cries. The boy was severely hypothermic, didn't speak or even cry. He looked about five years old. Lord, how long has he been sitting in the snow, the nanny said, who left the child outside. How did he end up here? Don't interfere, the nurse asked. She carefully removed the child's clothes, examined him, gently patting his cheeks. Boy, what's your name, can you hear me? The child remained silent. Help me, the nurse asked the caretaker, he took the child to the medical room. There they laid the child on a cot, rubbed his body with alcohol, wrapped him in a blanket. The nanny brought hot sweet tea from the kitchen. They carefully spoon-fed the child, and he obediently swallowed. Children gathered around the door, whispering, making their assumptions about where the abandoned child came from. Maybe he was kidnapped, and then they wanted to ask for ransom, Martin said. No, his parents just abandoned him, Neville argued. I was abandoned too, but not in winter and at the station, there were lots of people, they picked me up right away. What if he ran away from home? Louise speculated. Such a little one. No way, children from the home don't run away, Martin cut in knowingly. The door to the medical room opened, seeing the children, the caregiver ordered sternly. Come on, all of you, go to the playroom, no need to stand and make noise here. Don't you understand, the boy needs rest. You'll meet him later. The guys obediently walked down the corridor, continuing their debate about where the abandoned child outside their orphanage gates came from. The child was fine. The nurse was afraid that the child might develop pneumonia. The child had been sitting in the snowdrift for several hours. Most likely, he was left there overnight. But the child only caught a cold, had a slight fever, and coughed a bit for a few days. Care, medication, and warmth did their job, and the child began to recover. Jessica was one of those women who were accustomed to achieving everything on their own. Her parents were not wealthy, they were simple factory workers, so she couldn't rely on financial support from them. After finishing school, she went to college and then was hired at an advertising agency. Jessica was a talented web designer. Her personal client base was expanding rapidly. Clients wanted her to handle the development of their advertising projects, leaflets, bright brochures, posters, and other materials. You have an incredible sense of color, Jessica Parker, praised another client, examining the finished advertising product. We have new products coming up, could you develop a new slogan and advertising concept for us, a major client asked her, it's a very responsible task, and we can only entrust it to you. Our management is thrilled with your work, complimented Jessica's assistant manager, receiving his order. City council elections were coming up. Jessica's boss called her in. Jessica Parker, I would like you to take on the project for Mr. Lee, a candidate for deputy. He promises a good fee, and if Mr. Lee gets into the council, he will pay you the same amount again, the boss peeled off a sticker from a pack and wrote a number with five zeros on it. Jessica's eyes widened, she had never earned so much before. Mr. Lee wants you to take on his entire campaign, from start to finish, develop the concept and all materials, including newspaper articles, leaflets, 
posters, banners, TV commercials, the boss continued. The offer was more than tempting but also very responsible. Jessica lived in a rented apartment, she had long wanted her own, even if it was small. This was a chance to finally buy a place of her own. The boss looked closely at the contemplative Jessica. I hope you understand that during the campaign period, you'll have to give up all the projects you're currently working on, she told Jessica. Pass on the ongoing projects to your colleagues, decide who. This was the largest project in Jessica's time at the advertising agency. She was both excited and nervous. Hurrying to meet with the candidate for deputy and his assistant, she began to mentally develop the concept. She had already studied the experience of conducting election campaigns in other agencies, analyzed the mistakes that could lower ratings, and studied materials about Mr. Lee. She came prepared for a business conversation and productive cooperation. Have a seat, the man in the jacket invited her. I won't hide it, you were highly recommended to us as an excellent specialist with an unconventional approach to business. Currently, we have only one serious competitor in the city council elections, our task is to surpass him. I hope the fee is satisfactory to you? Absolutely, Jessica replied. I give you full carte blanche, you probably need money for current expenses. Our accounting department has been informed, you can request the necessary amount at any time, they will issue it to you, Mr. Lee paused for a moment. You must understand that we won't be cutting corners, so use any means necessary. There are only two months left until the elections, the deadlines are very tight, so I'm counting on your efficiency. Deal with all matters with my assistant, you can also contact me directly. Returning to the agency, Jessica handed over the ongoing projects to other colleagues. Not hiding their envy, they watched as she packed her laptop, some papers, flash drives, and disks into her bag. For the next two months, she would rarely be seen at the agency. The election campaign would require her personal presence at the candidates' events, business trips, and accompanying Mr. Lee at meetings with voters. Henry Lee, she addressed the deputy, analysis shows that representatives of the business community are on your side. Entrepreneurs, business leaders trust you, but you need to secure the support of ordinary citizens, ordinary residents of our city. It's their votes, mostly, that will be decisive. I'm listening, what do you suggest, Jessica Parker? I suggest conducting an interview at your home. I would like members of your family to be present, a homey, pleasant atmosphere, smiling faces. That's not a problem, Mr. Lee replied. Set the date, I'll prepare the family. On the appointed day, Jessica, accompanied by a local TV cameraman, arrived at Mr. Lee's family home. They were greeted by the candidate's assistant, who escorted them to the luxurious living room. Please make yourselves comfortable, get ready, the family will be down shortly, he said. Would you like something to drink? No, thank you. Jessica looked around. The setting was impressive, expensive furniture, paintings, a fireplace with porcelain figurines on it. Expensive and beautiful, she thought. The luxury in the house seemed more like a downside than an upside to her. When you start shooting, try to keep all these vases, figurines, and paintings in gilded frames out of the frame, she asked the cameraman. It's unnecessary, it might turn people against Mr. Lee. Our population isn't wealthy. Focus on the faces. Soon, the family members entered the living room. The candidate's wife looked stern and tense. Relax, dear, Mr. Lee told her. It's okay, be natural, speak calmly, smile more. What about me? asked a 14-year-old girl. She was dressed in jeans with ripped knees and a bright t-shirt. First of all, go change and wash off that war paint, her father pointed to her provocative clothes and makeup. Why, dad, the girl resisted. It's the first time they'll be showing me on TV, and I'll look like a boring mouse? I said, go, change and wash up, or you'll end up looking like an Indian warrior, going to war. Hi, everyone, the boy entered the living room. He looked about twenty. The young man was wearing jeans and a white sweater. His neat hairstyle suited him very well. I'm ready, Dad, he addressed Mr. Lee. What do I do? When everyone was ready, Jessica seated the family members on a large couch. 
A beautiful coffee service was placed on the table in front of them. Jessica took her position opposite. Let's begin, the operator commanded. We are visiting the candidate for deputy of the city council, Henry Lee. Please introduce us to your wife and children, Jessica began, looking into the camera lens. The interview followed Jessica's pre-prepared scheme. The questions were discussed in advance, and the answers were not unexpected for her. Our father is not just a dad to us, he's our friend, Mr. Lee's son recounted, and Jessica watched the young man attentively. There was something special about him. He differed from his mother and father in the absence of any hint of arrogance, spoke easily, not shy of the camera, as if he had been giving interviews his whole life. We can always turn to him for advice. Despite his busy schedule, Dad always finds time to watch an interesting movie with us or organize a picnic, Jessica thought. She couldn't imagine Mr. Lee sitting on the grass surrounded by his family or grilling meat on a barbecue. When the shooting was over, Jessica thanked the family members for their time and bid farewell. On the day of the election, all participants of the campaign were nervous. Preliminary results were announced on television every two hours. Mr. Lee would sometimes surge ahead, then slide back a few hundred votes, trailing behind his main competitor. But the final vote count showed Mr. Lee making it to the city council. The atmosphere in the headquarters of the now deputy was joyful. Campaign participants cheered, pouring champagne into glasses. Mr. Lee's son approached Jessica, offering her a glass. I congratulate you, he said, smiling. What for? Your dad is the one to congratulate, Jessica modestly replied. Don't be modest, you played a significant role in this campaign. Jessica couldn't help but feel proud of herself. This was the biggest project of her small career. It promised her a good future. It was long past midnight, but the campaign participants didn't disperse. It's so noisy here, Matthew said, smiling. Shall we sneak away? We have the right to take a break from the crowd, after all. The champagne was intoxicating, clouding Jessica's head. The mood was great, she felt like partying. Returning home and being alone didn't appeal to her at all. Jessica agreed to Matthew's suggestion. Taking her hand, the handsome young man hurried to the exit. His car was waiting by the porch, a beautiful foreign car with a convertible top. He helped Jessica in, and they drove off. The car sped along the illuminated highway past the houses where city dwellers had long been asleep. Can we add some music? Jessica asked. Anything for you, the guy replied, pressing a button on the stereo. He stopped the car by the lake, took out a bottle of champagne from the back seat, and a couple of plastic cups. Care for a drink? Jessica agreed. She was growing fonder of Matthew by the minute. Despite his father holding a high position, and from today being legitimately considered a city councillor, the guy treated her as an equal. He didn't boast about his background like some modern socialites. When Matthew leaned in to kiss her, Jessica unexpectedly didn't turn away. He was gentle, and she melted in his caresses and touches. You're so beautiful, he whispered in her ear. I want you, I really want you. Jessica's heart raced wildly, her breathing became heavy, and a soft moan escaped her chest. Something extraordinary was happening to her. She didn't realize herself how much passion was hidden in her body, how much desire this unfamiliar guy could awaken in her. Later, she lay there, cuddled up to him, feeling absolutely happy, while the barely noticeable dawn began to break in the sky. Jessica had a legal day off. After the election campaign, her boss allowed her to take two days off, after which Jessica Parker was supposed to resume her duties at the agency. Mr. Lee didn't deceive her. In the morning, she received a message on her phone. The money for the work was transferred to Jessica's account. The amount, as promised by the deputy, was doubled. The girl was ecstatic, she did a great job, she was able to earn money for her own place. And soon she would start looking for an apartment. There was a knock on the door while Jessica was having coffee in the kitchen. Adjusting her disheveled hair, she headed to the hallway. At the threshold stood a courier. This is for you, he said, handing her a bouquet of white roses. For me? From whom, the girl asked. 
I don't know, there's a note in the bouquet, the courier suggested, please sign the document. He handed Jessica the receipt and a pen. Closing the door, Jessica took out the note tucked between the buds. To the most beautiful girl in the world. I'll be waiting for you at 7 in the evening at the cafe in the square. Matthew. Absolutely happy, Jessica spun around the room with the bouquet in her hands. Then she suddenly stopped abruptly. Stop. He's inviting her on a date? What should she wear? Dresses, blouses, skirts flew out of the closet. Finally, the girl chose a blue dress with a small floral print. It suited her very well. She spent the whole day looking forward to meeting Matthew. Constantly checking the time, she thought they were moving too slowly, every minute felt like an hour. Matthew was waiting for her at a table on the open summer terrace of the cafe. You look beautiful, he said to her, pulling out a chair for Jessica. Let's order something, to be honest, I'm very hungry. Matthew handed Jessica the menu. Looking at the countless dishes, she suggested. Order whatever you like. They had a wonderful time, drinking wine, talking, and laughing a lot. In the small cozy cafe, they stayed until closing time. It was dark outside when Matthew drove her to her building. Jessica didn't want to part with him, and he held her hand for a long time. Shall we have some tea? she asked. With pleasure, his calm smile reassured Jessica that she was doing everything right. He left only early in the morning, promising to call Jessica. She fell into a happy sleep and slept until lunchtime. The next day, she spent at home, and on Monday, she returned to work at the advertising agency. Matthew didn't call, which tormented the girl. To distract herself from sad thoughts, she immersed herself completely in her projects. The workday ended. Lost in her thoughts, Jessica left the agency. Opposite the entrance, she saw a familiar car. Matthew waved his hand welcomingly from the car. Jessica rushed to him. Get in, let's go, the guy opened the door. Where to? Jessica asked. You'll find out soon, he said mysteriously. The car started and raced through the streets towards the city outskirts. Matthew brought the girl to a small recreation area. The place belonged to Matthew's father. He would come here with partners and colleagues to fish, relax, and barbecue. No one will be here today, just the guard, Matthew said, leading Jessica along a narrow path to a wooden log house. We'll have it all to ourselves. The girl was happy. Such beauty around. A river, a lake, with a boat swaying by the shore. When it got dark, they lit the fireplace in the house, sitting on the floor, embracing. I could spend my whole life like this with you, the guy said softly. And I, Jessica repeated to him. It's just a pity to part, he unexpectedly said. Part? Why? Jessica asked anxiously. My father is sending me abroad for an internship, sadness could be heard in his voice, I have to go. So soon. For how long? I'm leaving tomorrow. At least for a year, and then we'll see. They were silent. Each was lost in their own thoughts. So my little happiness has come to an end, the girl couldn't imagine how she would live now without these meetings with Matthew. The next day he left. Nine months later, Jessica gave birth to a son, named him Victor. Victor Price. Oh, Jessica Parker, I had such big plans for you, the boss said sadly, calling Jessica into her office. The girl's belly was already noticeably protruding, hiding the pregnancy was pointless. She had to say that in two months she would go on maternity leave. Who will work then? I'm not even talking about your regular clients, they'll leave us as soon as they find out you're not working anymore. Mrs. Lopez, I'll work until the birth, and then I'll be able to take on projects from home, Jessica assured. With the fee from the elections, she was able to buy a small two-bedroom apartment in the residential area. It was far from work, but it was her own place, not a rented one. Jessica carefully arranged the apartment, bought curtains, ordered furniture. Raphael, a colleague from work, volunteered to assemble the kitchen cabinets. He had long liked Jessica, but he didn't even hope for reciprocity. Jacqueline, a friend, came to help tidy up. 
She washed the floors, rolling up her skirt and tucking it into her belt, she kept talking, wringing out the rag. You're lucky, Jessica, you have your own apartment. There will be a place for the child to walk. Have you decided where to put the crib yet? And the changing table? And I haven't bought any of that yet, it's too early, and there's hardly any money left. Tomorrow they'll bring a sofa to the living room. Do you need a mover? Raphael volunteered to help carry the sofa to the third floor. Of course, thank you guys for helping. Jacqueline left, she had a date scheduled. And Raphael stayed to have some tea. Hasn't your boyfriend called, he asked. No, the girl sighed, no news from him. These rich kids always treat girls like that. If I were in his place, I would never leave you. You're not in his place, Raphael, don't start, Jessica didn't like her work colleague's speculations about her personal life. She noticed that he treated her differently, showed signs of attention. This fact did not please her, but without male help, it would be difficult in her case. Raphael helped carry groceries to her home and laid the tile in the bathroom himself. She didn't have to hire workers and pay extra money. When are you going to buy the crib? Raphael changed the subject, realizing that Jessica would get angry and kick him out. And he wanted to stay at her place a little longer. Next week, the girl replied, stroking her rounded belly. The baby was already kicking in her womb, Jessica flinched from his unexpected movements and rejoiced at the same time. Do you want me to come with you? Raphael offered. I'll borrow my father's car and we'll bring everything in one go. We'll buy a stroller, a crib, a bathtub, whatever else the baby needs. It would be great, Jessica agreed. Raphael kept his word. One day they left work early and went to the baby store. There was everything in this huge store. Toys, newborn clothing, bottles, toys, baby food. Passing by the shelves, Jessica couldn't contain her excitement. I just want to buy all of this for my boy, she told Raphael. Just look at how beautiful this bicycle is. He's still too young for a bicycle, Raphael laughed. At Jessica's home, he assembled the crib, attached the wheels to the stroller. Beautiful, you did a great job, praised his girlfriend. You've earned tea and cookies. They sat in the new kitchen. Raphael slowly stirred sugar in his cup, lost in thought. Suddenly, he looked Jessica straight in the eyes and said, Marry me. She was stunned into silence. Raphael had done so much good for her lately, taken care of her so much. She didn't want to hurt the guy. But she loved Matthew. Jessica still hoped he would come back. Raphael, I'm sorry, but you know, I don't love you. She began cautiously. That doesn't matter, the main thing is that I love you, the guy assured. With me, you'll be safe, I'll love your son like my own. I'll take care of you, of both of you. I'll do everything so that you never regret your decision to marry me. Jessica, I'm not rushing you, but don't take too long, the baby will be born soon. Jessica sat at the table, eyes downcast. When Raphael left, she pondered. Raphael is right, raising a child alone, especially a boy, is difficult. The child needs a father, and Jessica made a decision. A month before the birth, they registered their marriage. Raphael moved in with Jessica, they started living together. The guy really took care of his young wife. He cooked dinner after work, loaded the laundry into the washing machine himself, hung clothes on the balcony, cleaned on weekends, and took Jessica for walks. On the appointed day, he took her to the maternity hospital, calling the reception room every hour, asking if his wife had given birth. Dad, calm down, they told him on the other end of the line. Don't call here so often. Your wife will give birth, and she'll call you herself. Don't worry, she's not alone here. The boy was born healthy. Jessica looked at the baby with tenderness lying in the hospital bassinet. She thought he looked incredibly like his father. The same facial features, the same nose, and dimples on the cheeks. Victor was an unusually calm baby, Jessica rested a lot, quickly recovered, and was discharged home. Raphael and Jacqueline met her from the maternity hospital. In the young dad's hands were flowers, as well as a cake and sweets for the medical staff. 
check, daddy, the nurse said playfully, unwrapping the baby and preparing to dress him, are all the little fingers on his hands and feet in place? Raphael was at a loss. The tiny baby lay there, cooing and looking at him. The nurse dressed him, put a hat on him, wrapped him in a swaddle, and then in a newborn blanket. She handed the baby to Raphael, and he took him with trembling hands. Jessica's husband didn't let go of Victor until they got home. Let me carry him too, Jacqueline asked him. No, this is our treasure with Jessica, Raphael proudly replied. At home, they celebrated this event. A new person was born on planet Earth, Jessica's friend solemnly declared. May his path be successful, may nothing overshadow the joy of life. Jessica took a month's vacation, then promised to go to work remotely from home. Victor slept a lot, and the young mother had plenty of free time. Raphael went to work every day, and in the evening he hurried home to walk with the stroller in the yard, to help his wife bathe their son before bedtime. They had been married for several months, but there was no intimacy between the couple. Jessica found an excuse to refuse Raphael every time. At first he treated with understanding, thinking that after childbirth she needs to recover, and the child takes a lot of time, tired him Jessica. But one evening, when Victor was sleeping peacefully in his crib, Raphael tried to hug his wife, his hands insistently pulling up her nightgown. Don't, Raphael, Jessica tried to push her husband away. You have to, you're my wife, I can't do this anymore, he piled his whole body on top of her. His strong hands groped her breasts, buttocks, legs. Jessica gave in. Raphael did it to her regularly now. After sex, Raphael leaned back on the pillows and smiled contentedly. Jessica couldn't sleep for a long time afterward, still feeling his touch on her body. Being close to her husband did not make her happy. She was grateful to him for everything, but she didn't love him as much as she loved Matthew, who had disappeared from her life as suddenly as he had appeared. I'm going to visit my parents the other day, Jessica told him over breakfast. My father was sick and needed to visit, and my mother was anxious to see her grandson. Raphael finished chewing his sandwich. Go ahead, I'll take you to the bus station, he agreed. When you're coming back, give me a call, I'll pick you up. I know your mom, she'll load you up with groceries again. All right, I'll call, Jessica said as she stirred formula in a baby bottle and headed to the bedroom to feed Victor. The next day, Raphael escorted her to the intercity bus, carefully helped her in, then stepped out and, smiling, waved. Goodbye. Victor slept through the entire journey, only waking up when they reached Jessica's stop. My dear, I'm so glad you've come, Jessica's mother greeted her at the platform. I wasn't even hoping anymore. How was the trip? Are you tired? Everything's fine, mom, Victor slept the whole way, her daughter replied. Well, let's go quickly then, your father's home alone, we wouldn't want anything to happen to him, the woman hurried, taking the bag with the baby's things from her daughter's hands. Mom, it's so good to be home, Jessica rejoiced, undressing the baby. I've missed you so much, you have no idea. Jessica's mother sat down beside her, examining her grandson. Since their last meeting, he had noticeably grown. His dark hair curled in ringlets. Curly, just like you were in your childhood, Grandma said with a smile. Jessica's father emerged from the bedroom. He couldn't wait to hug his daughter and see his grandson. Well, Victor Price, we're going to be acquainted, he said, taking the baby's hand. The child immediately grasped his grandfather's finger. Wow, what a strong lad you are, growing up to be a little warrior, and I'm your grandpa. Dad, how's your health? Jessica asked with concern. I'm still getting around slowly, the man replied. Old age hasn't given anyone strength yet. Oh, come on, no matter how old you are, you'll still entertain us, Jessica tried to cheer up her father. Don't reassure me, I can't even help your mother in the garden anymore, my legs won't hold up, her father complained. She's out there taking care of it all by herself. Don't worry, I'll help, Jessica promised. All day long, they and her mother tended the beds, loosening the soil, watering, fertilizing, and picking berries. In the evenings, they would lock themselves in the kitchen, making jam and pouring it into jars. You'll take some home and treat Raphael, her mother would say. 
When it was time to return, Jessica's parents were reluctant to part with their daughter and grandson. Jessica's mother packed two bags with jars. Together, they struggled to carry them to the bus and load them on. How are you going to lug all this from the bus station? Her mother lamented. I'll call Raphael, he'll pick us up, Jessica replied. When the bus entered the city, she took out her phone from her purse. The screen traitorously didn't turn on, the battery was dead. Jessica was upset, what would she do with the baby in her arms, and with all these jars? It was her own fault, she should have checked if her mobile was charged while still at her parents' home. She was the last to exit the bus, the driver helped her unload the bags. Jessica struggled to the nearest taxi. Are you available? she asked the driver. Get in, he replied, helping the girl load the bags into the trunk. At the entrance of her building, she paid the taxi driver, took a deep breath, and looked up at the windows of the third floor. Of course, Raphael couldn't have known we were coming back, so he didn't come to meet us, she thought, opening the door to the entrance. The journey to the apartment felt more like a trial. Jessica carried her son up to each floor, sat him on the steps, then dashed downstairs for the bags. Then again, she first carried the child up the stairs, then went down for the bags. Finally, she stood at the door of her apartment. Jessica opened the door with her key. Raphael, she called, but there was no answer. The girl kicked off her shoes, walked into the living room, and sat her son on the couch. From the bedroom, she heard strange sounds and a woman's voice. Jessica opened the door and was stunned. In bed, oblivious to her arrival, Raphael and Jacqueline, her friend, were indulging in activities. Jacqueline was the first to notice Jessica. She pushed away from Raphael, covering her naked chest with the sheet. Raphael also looked up, his wife's arrival caught him off guard. Jessica. Was all he could manage to say. The girl closed the door. She sat on the couch next to her son, slowly undressing him. Jacqueline was the first to emerge from the bedroom. Jessica, you see, don't think anything bad, she began peaceably, trying to justify herself to her friend. But then she suddenly spoke with a steely voice. You're to blame yourself, a man needs attention, affection, and you, you're as cold as ice, as hard as a rock. And you're so proud. Jacqueline slammed the front door on her way out. Raphael came out of the bedroom. It seemed he didn't feel guilty, on the contrary, it was Jessica who was to blame for not warning about her arrival. She should have called, then this awkward situation wouldn't have happened. Raphael went to the kitchen, poured himself a shot from the half-empty bottle of vodka. Returning to the room where Jessica was neatly folding Victor's clothes into the closet, he asked her. Why aren't you screaming, accusing me of cheating? His speech was slightly slurred. Jessica's silence infuriated her husband even more. Too proud, huh? Raphael's agitation increased. Who needs you and your pride? He approached her, breathing alcohol into her face. Jessica tried to move away, but a strong punch to the face made her stagger, she fell to the floor. Raphael leaned over her and hissed. You'll be silk to me from now on. Raphael went to the kitchen, closed the door, and poured himself another shot of vodka. Jessica cried quietly, while Victor looked at his mother with bewildered eyes as she got up from the floor. From that day on, Jessica's husband changed for the worse. He often came home drunk, sometimes returning home in the morning. Arguments became a common occurrence in their house. Victor would wake up from his father's yelling, starting to cry, which only irritated Raphael even more. Jessica often suffered at the hands of Raphael, she tried to escape, locking herself in the bedroom to avoid her drunken husband, but he would find her, repeatedly accusing her of being cold towards him and not loving him, reminding her that he was raising another man's child. Where, he shouted, once again, coming home drunk. Where's his daddy? You're not needed. He abandoned you. He had his fun with you and left. And you, slut, you're not wanted. Once again, while covering up a bruise under her eye in the bathroom, Jessica suddenly felt unwell. She sat on the edge of the bathtub. Her head was spinning, and she felt nauseous. Well, now I even have a concussion, she thought to herself. 
The day before, Raphael had beaten her again. Only a week later, when the nausea and dizziness didn't subside, Jessica realized she was pregnant. Upon hearing this news, Raphael's expression changed. You mean, I'll have a child, he asked Jessica, not believing his ears. We'll have a child together? My own son. My blood. Raphael unexpectedly grabbed Jessica and spun her around the room. Stop it, she reluctantly asked. She didn't want to give birth to a child from an alcoholic husband who regularly abused her. Raphael understood her thoughts. He fell to his knees in front of Jessica, hugged her, pressed his cheek to her stomach, where their child's life was budding. Jessica, Jessica, he whispered, forgive me, please forgive me. I'll change, everything will change in our life. The woman remained silent, she couldn't bear to listen to her husband. Raphael lifted his head, looked at her, stood up, and said angrily. Just try to have an abortion, I'll kill you. In the remaining months before the birth, Jessica's husband didn't even touch her. He was attentive, always came home on time, and didn't drink. True, sometimes his shirt smelled strongly of women's perfume. But Jessica didn't pay attention to it. The pregnancy was very difficult. She was constantly nauseous, and her lower abdomen hurt. Sometimes she thought it would have been better if he had beaten her and she had a miscarriage. Children should be born from a beloved man, but every day Jessica felt indifference mixed with hatred towards Raphael. Raphael went with her to the next ultrasound. Jessica lay on the couch, lifted her blouse. Her husband stared at the screen attentively, as if he could understand what was appearing on it during the examination. But the polite nurse helped him figure it out. Look here, she began, pointing her finger at the black and white floating image, and suddenly fell silent. The woman stared at the monitor screen intently. Wow, daddy, congratulations, you're having twins. Jessica sat up in surprise, leaning on her elbow. Are you sure, she asked. We don't have twins in the family. We do, her husband interrupted. My grandfather had a twin brother, only he died in childhood. Well, you see, the nurse said, now everything becomes clear. And twins are good. They'll always be together, help each other in life if needed. Raphael and Jessica returned home in silence. They left Victor with their neighbor for a while. When he saw his mother, he dropped his toy, smiled, and reached out his arms. Well, come to me, my good boy, Jessica wanted to pick up her son, but her husband stopped her. You shouldn't lift anything heavy, give him to me, Raphael took Victor and carried him home. Jessica thanked the neighbor. Now Jessica's husband talked only about the twins who were about to be born. We need to buy a big stroller and a crib for the twins, he said. Jessica, you can't imagine how much I want them to be born, how much I want to hold them. All my friends' wives have one child each, but you, my dear, you're doing great, two at once. They'll envy us. Bringing something tasty from the store, Raphael repeated all the time, this is for my twins, eat, darling, feed the children, they need to grow. Jessica was annoyed by his fuss about her pregnancy. Labor began at night. Raphael called an ambulance, met the doctor at the entrance. After examining Jessica, the doctor said. Dress, take your things, and come down to the car. Jessica went to the hallway, where a prepared hospital bag was already standing, and hurried to it. Raphael rushed after her. Stay with Victor, she told her husband. No, I'll come with you. Are you out of your mind? Jessica objected. He's so small, you can't leave him alone at home. What could happen to him? Raphael argued, tying his shoelaces. If you don't stay with the child, I'll give birth at home. Jessica said sharply and sat down on a chair. Raphael straightened up. He understood that if he didn't send his wife to the maternity hospital now, there could be complications. After a minute of thought, he agreed. All right, all right, I'll stay with Victor, I'll just see you off to the car and come back, he said in a more conciliatory tone. Watching the ambulance drive away from the entrance, Raphael felt anxious. He headed around the corner of the building at a leisurely pace. There was a night bar in the neighboring five-story building, where you could always buy alcohol. 
Raphael bought two bottles of vodka and headed home. Victor was crying in his crib. The child had woken up. Not finding his mother within sight, he got scared. Raphael entered the bedroom, looked indifferently at the stepson. Well, why did you get up, lie down, let's sleep, he said, tucking the child into bed and covering him with a blanket. The man closed the door and went to the kitchen. He drank until morning, then fell asleep at the table. A phone call and Victor's cry woke him up from his drunken sleep. Raphael didn't immediately understand where to run first. Grabbing the child in his arms, he started looking for the phone. A missed call from his wife was displayed on the screen. Raphael tried to call back, but the subscriber was already out of range. Damn, Raphael cursed, seating Victor in the high chair. He dialed the maternity hospital's number. Hello, can you tell me if my wife has given birth? What? The surname, he gave Jessica's details. The woman on the other end of the line paused for a moment and then replied. Yes, she gave birth. Two girls, weighing 300 and 400 grams, the twins' height is 52 centimeters. The mother feels well. Girls? Raphael asked incredulously. Are you sure you're not mistaken? But they had already hung up the phone. Raphael sat down on a stool. Victor was gnawing on a rusks, looking at his stepfather with wide eyes. Your mother gave you sisters, the man told the child, as if he could understand what was happening in Raphael's soul right now. He had dreamed of a son, and when he found out there would be twins, he had already imagined himself a happy father of two boys, proud of them, walking with them in the playground. And this heartless Jessica couldn't even give birth to normal boys, she had given birth to girls. A wave of disappointment engulfed the man. He opened the fridge, took out a sealed bottle of vodka. On the day of discharge, Raphael arrived at the maternity hospital reeking of alcohol. He held Victor by the hand. The boy was wearing stale clothes. In the man's hands was a bouquet of flowers showing signs of wilting. Well, daddy, here are your daughters, the nurse said, wrinkling her nose at the smell emanating from the man. Raphael took the girls in his arms, and Jessica rushed to her son. Victor, I missed you so much, she exclaimed. The boy hugged his mother, not wanting to let her go. At home, Raphael placed a bottle of vodka on the table. Let's have a drink for the health of the girls, shall we, he said, pouring vodka into two glasses. I'm feeding the children, I won't drink, Jessica refused. She couldn't stand looking at her hungover husband. The woman undressed the girls, while Victor stood nearby and looked at his sisters. Here, my good boy, soon they'll grow up, and you'll play with them. It'll be fun for you together. Grow up quickly to be their protector. The girls were named Rose and Olivia. Now Jessica had to give up her job completely. With three children, she couldn't even work part-time. There was almost no help from Raphael. He came home drunk more and more often, yelled loudly, blamed his wife for not giving him sons. What good is this female battalion to me, he would say. What will I do with them? Can't even go fishing or play ball with them, and repairs, who will help me with repairs, who will pass me the hammer? Girls always love their father more than their mother, Jessica tried to reassure her drunken husband. Why do I need their love? They love more. And all the guys laugh at me. In reality, nobody ever laughed at Raphael. On the contrary, all their acquaintances said that having two daughters was double happiness. Yet, he remained dissatisfied. When the girls turned two years old, Raphael had another affair. He didn't come home for a whole week. The fridge was completely empty. Jessica didn't even have milk to cook porridge for the children. She had to beg the neighbor to watch the girls and Victor while she went to the store. In the evening, Raphael stumbled into the apartment barely able to stand. Wife, he yelled from the doorway. Get some food ready. Jessica lost her temper, her patience had finally run out. And did you buy anything to eat? Where have you been for so many days, she asked. There's no food in the house, nothing to cook with, and we're starving here. There's no one to go to the store. And can't you do it yourself, shouted her husband. Don't you have any money? 
Are you trying to say that I'm poor, that I don't provide for the family? Raphael lunged at his wife, and Jessica quickly dodged, trying to escape to the bedroom where the children had just fallen asleep. But Raphael's strong hand caught her. He grabbed her, pushed her to the floor, and began undressing her. I'm a good husband, and I'll prove it to you now, he yelled into Jessica's ear, reeking of alcohol. The woman tried to break free from under her husband's heavy body, but he pressed her harder against the floor. Get away, she screamed. You're disgusting. Her words were followed by a powerful blow to the head. Everything blurred before Jessica's eyes, the wardrobe, the chandelier on the ceiling, the sofa, her husband looming over her with a raised fist. He continued to beat his wife for a long time, hitting her face, head, kicking her stomach, her entire body. After venting his anger, Raphael went to the kitchen, grabbing the half-empty bottle of vodka from his jacket pocket. I'll show you what it means not to love your husband, to argue with a man in his own house, he muttered through his teeth. Raphael woke up in the middle of the night. Shaking, he walked into the room where Jessica lay on the floor. Hey, why aren't you getting up, he said, staring at his wife. Get up, come on, I've run out of money, give me some money for a bottle of vodka. Jessica didn't answer and didn't move. Raphael pulled her by the hand, trying to lift her, but her lifeless body showed no signs of life. Is she dead, the man thought. He bent down to her face, trying to listen to her breathing. She's dead, Raphael began to sober up abruptly, to come to his senses. Gradually, he began to understand what had happened. He had beaten his wife to death. The man was scared, he paced around the room, not knowing what to do. Now he would be sent to prison, but he couldn't allow that, he didn't want to end up behind bars. Sitting on the couch, Raphael clasped his head in his hands, began to rock back and forth like a cobra before an attack, whimpering quietly. The only possible way out seemed very clear to him. He had to hide the body, take it far away from home to remove suspicion from himself. The man dressed, wrapped his wife's lifeless body in the blood-stained carpet, hoisted it over his shoulder, and quietly left the apartment. He crossed the empty courtyard, passed through the forested area, and reached the lake. Walking on the ice, he fell several times, dropping his wife's body, then getting up and dragging her again towards the center of the water. There were ice holes there. Raphael lowered the body into the water, watching as the dark water took Jessica into its depths. When he returned home, he cleaned the dishes in the kitchen, washed the floor in the room, tried to tidy up. Raphael spent the rest of the night showering, shaving, trying to look normal. He realized that Jessica would soon be searched for, and maybe fishermen would find her body in the lake by morning. He decided to report his wife missing, saying that she had left in the evening and had not returned yet. The police did not accept his statement. Your wife will come back, said the police captain at the duty station. These things happen, wives get lost, maybe she stayed with a friend? Go home and wait. And if she doesn't show up in three days, we'll take your statement then. Raphael couldn't sit still. He had killed his wife, the mother of his children, with his own hands. Oh, yes, he remembered about the children. They were playing on the floor. He had to feed them. Raphael opened the refrigerator, but it was empty. There was nothing on the shelves of the kitchen cabinets either. Raphael scratched his forehead. I'll have to go to the store, he thought. He knocked on the neighbor's door. Liana, hello, could you please watch my kids for 20 minutes, he asked. I'll quickly run to the store and buy some food. The woman reluctantly agreed. Raphael dashed to the supermarket mentally composing a list of what he needed to buy. Fishermen discovered Jessica's body. They pulled the dead woman onto the ice and called the police. Did she drown? Maybe someone helped her, who would go swimming at this time? The investigation questioned Raphael. He was the prime suspect in his wife's murder. Where were you last night? The detective asked him. I was at home, he replied. I put the kids to bed, watch TV. Then the girls started crying, so I rocked them to sleep. Their mother wasn't home at the time. His testimony was quite convincing. After a little more questioning, the police left. 
the investigation hit a dead end and was put on hold. A few days later, Jessica's body was handed over to her husband for burial. Jacqueline volunteered to help with the funeral arrangements. She sat with the children while Raphael went to the cemetery to buy a plot for his wife, then to the funeral home, then to the morgue. At the funeral, people whispered. Such a young woman, and already gone. How will the kids manage without her? She was such a good mother, caring, always with the children. I can't believe she had an affair. Then who killed her? It's scary to live like this, you go out and end up in a hole in the ice with your head smashed in. After Jessica's funeral, Jacqueline moved in with Raphael. They had been dating for several years in her rented apartment. Now there was no need to hide, they could live together. Because of this whole unfortunate incident, Raphael was fired from the advertising agency. His boss had long disliked his absences from work and his habit of showing up drunk. We have to part ways with you, said Mrs. Lopez, scrutinizing him through thick glasses. Depressed, Raphael started drinking again. Jacqueline gladly kept him company. While drinking with him in the kitchen, she lamented. How are we going to live now? You need to find a new job urgently. We can't live on just my salary. Do you think it's easy to find a job in our city in my field? Raphael slurred. How are we going to feed your children? Jacqueline persisted. He didn't have an answer to that question. Right now, he was worried about something else. Jacqueline, go to the store, buy a bottle of vodka, he said, twirling the empty vodka bottle in his hand. And get something for the kids to eat. He pulled out a few bills from his pocket, all that was left from the payment he received from the agency. The kids whimpered, sitting on the floor amidst their toys, hungry. The intoxicated father handed them each a piece of rye bread. Quiet, he said, putting a finger to his lips. Mom Jacqueline will bring you food soon. The woman returned with two bottles of vodka. Not knowing what to buy for the children, she grabbed some sausages and milk. Do you think they'll eat sausages? Raphael asked. I don't know, we eat them, so they'll eat too, Jacqueline justified. And if they refuse, we'll eat them ourselves. But really, Raphael, I'm not obligated to feed your kids. You should think about their nutrition yourself. It's not easy to feed all three of them, the man said thoughtfully. Yeah, especially since Victor isn't even your child. And now you'll have to raise him, spend money. Suddenly, an unexpected thought occurred to Jacqueline. Raphael, why don't you take him to an orphanage, she suggested, lighting a cigarette. To an orphanage? No, that's difficult. Besides, if I give him up, they might take away my parental rights to the girls. And they're mine, my own flesh and blood daughters. But Victor isn't your own son, Jacqueline persisted. Victor may not be my own, but I won't go to an orphanage. Then social services will call me in for questioning, and I don't work. Do you want me to lose my daughters? Jacqueline pouted. She didn't like the prospect of raising and caring for Jessica's son, whose paternity was uncertain. Leave him at the orphanage gate. We have a big orphanage in our city. They have such big gates, iron ones, they'll find him and take him in, the man's mistress suggested, offering a way out of the situation. After thinking for a while, Raphael agreed with Jacqueline that it was the only way out. This way, the girls would stay with him, and he would get rid of an extra mouth to feed. When it got dark outside and the lights in the houses went out, Raphael and Jacqueline dressed Victor, handed him his favorite stuffed dog, and drove him to the orphanage gate. Stay here, they told the child and left. Snow was falling outside. The February wind howled, frightening the five-year-old boy. To make it less scary, he closed his eyes and hugged his stuffed dog tighter. Victor was found in a snowdrift by the children who, along with the guard Mr. Garcia, were clearing snow on the grounds of the children's institution. They patched him up, left him at the orphanage, and the administration of the orphanage contacted the police, but no one announced the search for the boy. When asked, what's your name, the child replied, Victor. They left him with that name, and they gave him the last name Hughes. The boy quickly befriended Martin Adams and Louisa. 
The kids were a couple of years older than Victor and took care of him diligently at first, teaching him the ropes. When you go to dinner, Martin said seriously, don't eat the gingerbread right away, take it with you. You know how you get hungry at night. That's when the stash will come in handy. Martin always kept a supply of food in his bedside table. Besides gingerbread, at night he would pull out crusts of bread from the drawer. The kids would all chew on them together, gazing out the window at the night sky. They used to argue sometimes. Once they had a fight on the playground, rolling around in the grass, hitting each other. Whatever friends don't share, no one will ever know. Guard Mr. Garcia was the first to notice the fight, limping on his right leg, he hurried to the playground. Stop it, now, he shouted sternly, but the boys kept rolling around in the grass. Then Mr. Garcia took a bucket, filled it with water, and poured it sharply onto the boys. To his surprise, the cold water didn't cool down the fervor of the fighting friends, they kept hitting each other without stopping. Now that's what I call strong friendship, the guard thought, recalling an old saying about friendship. In their school years, the group would arrange adventures for themselves, sneaking out through a hole in the fence and heading into the city. No one knew about their secret passage. The board was held by a single nail, easily pushed aside and put back into place and the kids would quietly pass by the sleeping guard Mr. Garcia, running through the forest park to the city streets, where the colorful lights of signs, beautiful cars, and the opportunity to forget about the walls of the orphanage for a while beckoned them. One such night, they sat on the shore of the lake and made a bonfire. Sparks flew high above the flames, mesmerizing them. Martin had sticks in his hands, onto which they skewered pieces of bread. The bread toasted over the fire was fragrant and pleasant to crunch on in their mouths. What do you want to become? Martin asked Victor. I haven't thought about it yet, maybe I'll go to college, the teenager replied, adding twigs to the fire. Ridiculous, you want to go to college just to live on one salary for the rest of your life, the boy laughed at Victor's naivety. And what's wrong with that? That's how everyone lives, the younger opponent tried to argue. You're mistaken, not everyone at all. I don't want to study at all. There are many ways to make money without having to work like a slave. What ways are those? Victor wondered. I'll tell you later, Martin intrigued the group. The teenager developed a whole plan on how to get rich. In his imagination, everything seemed easy and simple. One day, when they sneaked out through the fence again and escaped from the orphanage, Martin told Louise and Victor about it. It's very simple. We find some car with a woman behind the wheel. She gets in the car, starts reversing. And then Louise gets hit by the back wheels. Um, what are you talking about? I don't want to end up in the hospital or become disabled for life. I don't want to throw myself under the wheels, Louise objected. Don't worry, you'll just pretend. You'll only get lightly tapped by the bumper. The woman will jump out of the car, and you pretend to cry, pretend it hurts a lot. I've studied these chicks in expensive cars well. She'll start running around you, worrying that you need help. And you don't hurry to get up, just lie there on the ground. At that time, Victor and I will sneak up to the car and grab the bag with money from it. Then we'll all run away together, throw away the bag, and keep the money for ourselves. That's my brilliant plan. But that's stealing, Victor resisted. He clearly didn't like Martin's plan. Oh, come on, these women in their expensive cars have so much money that it's practically falling out of their pockets. They won't miss it. Victor and Louise pondered. Then the girl said. I agree, I'm tired of wearing clothes for the poor. I want fashionable jeans and a purse. Victor, are you with us? Martin asked his friend. The teenager hesitated. He thought that all this game of robbers would end badly. But he didn't want to separate from his group of friends either. We can try, he said uncertainly. Decided, concluded Martin. Tomorrow, we're going to do it. After squeezing through the hole in the fence, they walked towards the city center. Cars zoomed along the streets, people hurried somewhere, mothers with strollers strolled in the park, and children happily ran around. All these people had different lives, completely different from Louise's, Martin's, and Victor's. 
They were taken care of in the orphanage, but the absence of parents weighed heavily on the hearts of every ward. Victor always wanted to know all the details of his origin, who his mom and dad were, and how he ended up in a snowdrift at the gates of the children's institution. When it was time, the matron, Mrs. Wright, would call the older kids, take out their personal files, and tell them what was known from the child's birth history. One day, Victor approached her himself. Mrs. Wright, do you know who my parents are? After all, I wasn't delivered by a stork. Not a stork, Victor, but in a snowdrift, the matron smiled, but a second later her face became serious. When you came to us, or rather when we found you, we tried to find out all the information about you, but it was too scanty. Nobody reported you missing, nobody was looking for you. So, we don't have accurate information. Victor bit his lip in frustration. Odd, were his parents really so indifferent to their son's fate? Then why did they bring him into this world? He once shared his thoughts with the guard, Mr. Garcia. The children in the orphanage were friends with the man, they trusted him like a grandfather, and he was kind to them. In Mr. Garcia's small room, posters of motorcycles and photos from races adorned the walls. The boys were interested in them, and the guard enjoyed telling them about the features of the machines. Why don't you ride motorcycles anymore? Victor asked him once. Mr. Garcia, many years ago, when he left the hospital, swore off participating in races. He remained lame, despite the doctor's efforts, the bones in his right leg healed incorrectly. Not even the apparatus helped. One leg remained slightly shorter than the other. Everything has its time, Victor, the guard replied after some thought. I've already lived my life, now I'm fighting with all of you. The man enjoyed working in the orphanage. Constant interaction with children rejuvenated him. He never had children of his own, and here was suddenly a whole group of noisy boys and girls. Mr. Garcia, why do people have children? Victor asked, just to abandon them in orphanages? It's not like that, son, the man replied. You see, there are different situations in life. Sometimes parents die. Why would that happen, the teenager interrupted him. For different reasons. Someone gets sick, someone gets into an accident, there are various accidents. Why was I abandoned? Victor persisted. I can't tell you that. After all, almost nothing is known about you in general. There's not even a birth date in your personal file. Your birth date was made up, they chose a nice number. So, I'm like an invisible person. Sort of here, but sort of not, Victor remarked. Don't worry about it, the man reassured him. In any case, everyone builds their own life, their own destiny. When you grow up, get an education, maybe get married, have your own children, then you'll understand everything. He looked sadly at the departing boy. It was really hard for him to live without knowing anything about himself. It's like in nature, if a plant has no roots, the top doesn't grow. Victor had no roots, or rather, he knew nothing about them. He just lived the way he had to. But he was a good kid, I felt sorry for him. The guy spotted a car at the supermarket. A beautifully dressed woman of about 50 got out of it, a handbag in her hands. I wish I had one of those, Louise thought. They stood behind a tree and watched. Pressing the alarm button, closing the car, the woman went to the entrance of the store. Let's wait, she should be out soon, Martin said. The woman did come out about ten minutes later. She opened the car, threw her purse on the front passenger seat, got behind the wheel, and put the key in the ignition. The car started back up and suddenly, the woman heard a thud. Looking in the rearview mirror, she saw the girl falling under the car. Jesus! cried out the woman and jumped out of the car. Girl, how come, what are you in pain? Forgive me, please, I did not notice you. Oh, oh, it hurts, Louisa theatrically cried and squirmed, sitting on the ground. Woman, you ran over me with your car. Oh, it hurts so bad. Where does it hurt? The woman tried to feel the girl's legs. Meanwhile, Victor was already running away with her purse in his hands. Wait, I'll call an ambulance. The woman hurried to the driver's door to fetch her phone from her purse, but it wasn't on the front seat. 
she turned around, there was no one near the car either. The girl she hit and wanted to help was no longer there. Satisfied with their operation, the kids bought treats, sausages, bread, and headed back to their spot by the lake. They laughed, pleased with their first successful escapade. See, Victor, everything was thought out to the smallest detail, Martin boasted. I told you it would work out. The woman turned out to be a real rich lady. There were many large bills in her purse, which the kids spent on whatever they wanted for a whole week. Louise bought herself jeans, and Martin bought a watch with a chronometer. Victor decided to save his share, contributing only to the communal fund for food. He had a dream, to find his parents, and it would take money to achieve his goal. We'll go on another job in a week, Martin said, munching on sausages and bread roasted over the fire. Victor didn't like the whole situation. It was plain theft, and sooner or later they could end up in jail for it. He understood that, so he tried to dissuade his friends. Maybe we shouldn't, it's illegal, Victor's feeble attempt to reason with Louise and Martin sparked protests. Louise hugged him around the neck. Oh, come on, it's easy and simple, no one will find out, she persuaded Victor. Let's go a few more times, and then we'll stop. After all, we'll be leaving the orphanage soon. Victor couldn't refuse the girl. It turned out that he himself didn't notice how Louise had taken control of him, twisted the ropes, and always got what she wanted. And now, looking into his eyes, she persuaded him. Come on, I Victor, everything worked out for us the first time, it will work out now too. Doubting, Victor agreed. On the appointed day, they went to the shopping center, where there were always many cars in the parking lot. They spotted a richly dressed woman. There, look, the woman is coming, Martin pointed out. She's all decked out in jewels. She surely has money. The kids took their positions and waited. When the woman came out of the shopping center and headed for her car, Louise squatted behind the rear bumper. The plan was simple, as soon as the woman started reversing, Louise would pretend to be hit again, and while she distracted the woman, the boys would do their part. Unexpectedly, someone grabbed her hoodie from behind and pulled her aside. Come on, let's go, Louise saw Mr. Garcia. We're done playing games, it's time to face the consequences which you obviously don't care about, he said, dragging her away from the parking lot. Darn it, where did he come from? Martin cursed. He ruined the whole operation for us, where are we going to get the money now? And he'll report us to the director, we'll be locked up, unable to go anywhere anymore. The boys watched with annoyance as the guard dragged the girl away. He held her arm tightly, walking in silence. Louise followed Mr. Garcia, head down caught red-handed. Who would have thought? The guard dragged Louise into his quarters and sat her down on a chair. Tell me, what were you doing there? He began the interrogation. Nothing, just sitting around. Louise replied. You have nowhere else to sit except under cars in the parking lot? Mr. Garcia looked closely at the girl. He understood everything perfectly and saw Martin and Victor standing behind the tree, but he decided to start with Louise. The boys would come to her rescue on their own. The guard was sure of that. And it happened exactly as he predicted. Less than an hour passed before there was a cautious knock on the guard's door. Well, come in, loafers, Mr. Garcia shouted. So, have you finally decided to spend some time in jail? Mr. Garcia, we didn't mean to, Martin began to justify. We just need money, they feed us poorly at the orphanage, you know, and our clothes are old. And so you resort to stealing? Where else are we supposed to get money? Louise piped up. Have you tried working? Who would hire us? Martin defended. You could wash cars at the intersection or work as porters at the market. Look at yourselves, you're already big enough. Isn't it shameful to rob poor, weak women? You found poor women, do you know how much money they have? Martin started but immediately fell silent under Mr. Garcia's stern gaze. However much they have, it's their money, not yours. If I catch you engaging in this again, you'll regret it. That's it, the conversation is over, the guard cut him off. Get out of here, slackers, and you, Victor, stay. 
The boy looked at Mr. Garcia in surprise. He wondered what the man needed from him. He's going to lecture me now, teach me the right way to live, Victor thought. Mr. Garcia remained silent as he poured tea into two cups. He took some cookies out of the cupboard. Help yourself, he offered the boy. Victor hesitantly took a treat from the plate. Louise and Martin, loafers, Mr. Garcia said. But why did you get involved in this criminal activity? What did you need it for? Victor remained silent. Understand, ruining your life forever is very easy, but then you'll regret it. You'll regret one wrong deed a hundred times, but it will be too late. Yes, maybe you don't have enough at the orphanage, but you should strive for better. You need to study, then get a job. When you finish your education, the state will give you an apartment, as an orphan. That's when your independent life will begin. But if you end up in prison, consider yourself to have lost everything. You won't leave yourself any chances for a good life. I want to find my parents, Victor looked up at the guard. It was his cherished dream. I can't live normally without knowing who I am. And I don't know who I am. Maybe my parents have been looking for me all my life, maybe I have brothers and sisters, grandparents, like normal kids. Maybe they're suffering because I got lost. Mr. Garcia looked thoughtfully out the window. He felt sorry for the boy. He was nothing like the children who were raised in the orphanage. Over the many years of work, he had seen a lot, and he was increasingly convinced that genetics influenced the future. What is written in one's destiny cannot be changed, and no amount of humane upbringing can change that. Children of thieves become thieves, it happens often. But it didn't seem like Victor was born into a family of thieves. There was something different about him. I already told you, it's practically impossible to find your roots, the guard tried once again to convince Victor to forget about finding his parents. I want to hire a private detective, so I need money, the boy shared his plans. A detective, you say you want to hire? Mr. Garcia looked closely at the boy. Tell me, buddy, what information will you bring to the detective? What will you tell him? My name is Victor, the surname is made up, I'm looking for parents I know nothing about. You don't even know your real date of birth. So what? Private detectives can do anything, Victor sincerely believed. They can do anything, the guard grumbled. All right, go on, detective. Left alone, Mr. Garcia pondered how to help the boy and whether it could be done without any information. He had one old friend with whom they used to participate in motorcycle races in their youth. Then Teddy went to serve in the army, and afterwards worked in the police force. By retirement, he had risen to the rank of lieutenant colonel, and now he was known as Teddy Murphy, a respected man and a good investigator. Mr. Garcia firmly decided to turn to him, even though it wasn't his style to bother people and use connections. He just really wanted to help the boy, maybe something would become clear in his case. Teddy Murphy still lived in the same place. In retirement, he had plenty of free time. The police lieutenant colonel bought himself a boat and often went fishing. This time, he was checking his gear, unwinding the line, inspecting the floats, when there was a knock on the door. Standing on the threshold was his longtime friend. Oh, how they used to race motorcycles in their youth, compete, and win trophies. They even got mentioned in the newspapers. But then Brody crashed, spent a long time in the hospital, and their communication gradually faded away. Teddy Murphy was very happy to see his unexpected guest on the doorstep of his apartment. Brody, is that you? I can't believe my eyes, he exclaimed, immediately recognizing his friend. It's me, it's me, you're not mistaken, Mr. Garcia smiled. Come in quickly, dear, why are we standing in the doorway? Teddy Murphy invited the guard. Are you alone or with your wife? Mr. Garcia asked. Just me, my wife passed away five years ago, she had cancer, the doctors couldn't save her. At least she didn't suffer for long. I'm alone too, my personal life didn't work out. No wife, but I have 40 kids, Mr. Garcia shared. How's that, his friend didn't understand. I work at the orphanage, they're all like family to me there. I feel sorry for the kids, so I spend time with them in my free time. 
Well, well, who would have thought that Brody would become a father figure for orphans? Teddy Murphy was amazed. The men went into the kitchen. Teddy Murphy bustled about, put the kettle on the stove, took out sausage and cheese from the fridge, as well as a bottle of vodka. Such a meeting, my friend, shouldn't go uncelebrated, he said, laughing and taking out shot glasses from the sideboard. The men drank, snacked, and Teddy Murphy poured another round. I won't even ask how you found me, Brody, Teddy Murphy said, munching on a slice of smoked sausage. I haven't changed my address. But what brought you to me? Can't be just nostalgia or longing for the old times. And that too, the guard said, raising his glass. Well, to our meeting. To our meeting, I'm very glad to see you. You know, Teddy, Mr. Garcia began a serious conversation. I have a boy in the orphanage, Victor. His story is very strange, unclear. If other children who end up in the institution have at least some information, he has none. The child comes from the maternity hospital, where a document of abandonment arrives. It means the mother and father refuse to raise their son or daughter. Or another common scenario, when parents are alcoholics and neglect their child, then the court takes the child away. Or when both parents die and the orphan is sent to a children's home. We found this boy in a snowdrift in February, he was five years old. The retired police lieutenant colonel listened attentively to his friend. He didn't yet understand where he was leading, but he tried to grasp the logical thread of the story. You see, Mr. Garcia continued, it seems that he was abandoned. They simply left him out in the cold winter night at the gates of the orphanage, put him in a snowdrift, gave him a toy, and left. Not humans, but beasts, Teddy Murphy shook his head. How could anyone abandon a little child in the cold like that? And don't even mention it. When we found him, he was completely frozen, couldn't even speak. Well, we warmed him up, cleaned him, fed him. Now he's a grown man. But he's still haunted by the thought of who left him there. He dreams of finding his parents, you understand? Teddy Murphy poured vodka into the glasses, took his own, and nudged Mr. Garcia. I understand, who wouldn't? Everyone wants to know their roots, and this story gives me goosebumps. Help, Paliak, find some clue about the kid. He wants to hire a private detective, that's why he turned to stealing. And that's very bad, Teddy Murphy raised his finger. I get it, intervened just in time, caught him in the act, so to speak. I think he won't go for that again. The boy is good, there's potential in him. I don't even know how I can help. The retired lieutenant colonel pondered. In what year did he come to you? Mr. Garcia mentioned the exact date when Victor was found in the snowdrift at the gates of the orphanage. That day was etched in his memory for life. He had never seen such brutal treatment of a little child. If the child had frozen to death, they would have found a corpse, not a boy. Let's do this, Teddy Murphy suggested after some thought. I'll visit my colleagues in the police, ask around, maybe someone remembers something? I was still serving in the department that year, but I don't recall anything about missing children. That's the thing, Mr. Garcia said, we checked, nobody filed a missing person report, nobody was looking for this boy. I promise, Brody, said the old friend, I'll look into it, find out everything I can. I'll find some thread, it can't be that there's absolutely no information about a person at all. The friends continued to sit, drink, talk about the past, and share news. Mr. Garcia returned to the orphanage hopeful. His friend had always been a man of his word, so if he promised, he would do everything possible to find some information about Victor and his family. He understood that Victor wouldn't rest until he found out everything, and because of this, he might ruin his life. Therefore, he was determined to help Victor, and he very much hoped that his old friend would assist him in this. A few days later, Teddy Murphy called Mr. Garcia. There's some information I've got, can you come over to my place? He asked. Of course, I can. When the old friends met, the retired lieutenant colonel had photocopies of some documents in his hands. He neatly stacked them and laid them out in front of him. Mr. Garcia waited for Teddy Murphy to start his story. He was curious about what the former investigator had unearthed. 
Your Victor's story is quite strange, Teddy Murphy began. In February of that year, when you found your Victor, a woman's body was found in the lake. Fishermen pulled it out in the morning when they came to the ice hole. There was no chance of identifying the woman, but everything became clear when her lawful husband went to the police. He reported his missing wife. The duty officer sent him home and said that it had been only a short time since his wife disappeared. And when the woman's body was found in the lake, they immediately remembered about this man. He was questioned then, I wasn't present, but my colleagues recalled that he didn't look very upset. Of course, he became the prime suspect in the murder. Why did they assume it was murder, the guard asked, not understanding. You see, the body had multiple injuries, bruises, broken teeth, the face was disfigured. She was severely beaten by someone. Considering that the woman was wearing a bathrobe, they immediately suspected the husband. He, of course, denied everything. At that time, there were three young children in the house, twin girls aged two and a five-year-old boy. As we later found out, the boy wasn't the man's biological son, he got married when the bride was already pregnant. Neighbors said that recently the spouses often argued there were shouts, quarrels, and the children crying. So, did the husband kill the woman? Mr. Garcia asked. It's not that simple, said the lieutenant colonel. He said she left the house in the evening, and when he returned from work, he found the children alone in the apartment. He was outraged that she could leave them unsupervised. He said he spent the whole night taking care of the children, putting them to bed, soothing them when they cried and called for their mother. Interesting, Mr. Garcia said thoughtfully. But why did she leave the house in winter wearing a bathrobe? That's the thing, the old friend continued. They also found a carpet with bloodstains in the lake. But the man, that is, the woman's husband, didn't admit that it was their carpet. He said he was seeing it for the first time. There were no witnesses who could prove otherwise. This carpet baffled the investigation. The husband's alibi was weak, of course. The children couldn't confirm that their father spent the whole night with them. But there was also no reason to claim otherwise. There were no traces of blood or a fight in the house, everything was clean, the children were fed, and neatly dressed. This man was just an approximate father. Perhaps the investigation didn't dig deep enough, didn't investigate thoroughly. Eventually, the case was closed. And what does this have to do with our victor, the guard didn't understand. I suspect that the eldest child, the five-year-old boy who was in the apartment with the twin sisters, is your victor. Why do you think so? I started to look into the further life of this family. There isn't much known about it, but there's still something. After the death of his wife, the man started living with another woman. According to neighbors, they often drank. Apparently, they didn't care much about the children, at least they were rarely seen outside with them but they were often spotted coming home from the store with wine. What does Victor have to do with this? Mr. Garcia, still not understanding anything, persisted. The puzzle that was supposed to shed light on Victor's appearance in the orphanage was not coming together in his mind yet. After finishing school, the twin sisters left the city. Where they are now is unknown. Of course, we could put out a search for them and find them, but it will take time but nothing is known about the boy at all. It's as if he never existed at all, and you could think that if it weren't for that criminal case. There are three children involved in it. But in fact, only the fate of the sisters can be traced. So, Mr. Garcia began to guess, the man got rid of his wife to live with another woman. The child, not his own by blood, was not needed by him. He decided to get rid of him and dumped him at the gates of the orphanage? Like that? That's how it seems, agreed the lieutenant colonel, but there's zero evidence. Even if we find the sisters, they won't help. They were too young and probably don't even know they had an older brother. What kind of bastard do you have to be to do this to a child? He could have just brought him to the orphanage, surrendered him, written that he was giving him up. Why freeze the kid? Don't you know our system? Said the old friend. If he had done as you say, he could have been deprived of parental rights and even of his other children, his twin daughters. And apparently, his daughters were dear to him. 
Can you find out how to find this man, is he even alive? Mr. Garcia asked. Already found out, solemnly declared the lieutenant colonel. He's alive, but not very healthy, doesn't work anywhere, but always finds something to drink. An alcoholic, is he? Yes, the old friend replied, handing Mr. Garcia a photocopy from the criminal case with the data of the man who possibly killed his wife and left the child at the gates of the orphanage on a cold February night. Thank you, my friend, I will be grateful to you forever, Mr. Garcia shook hands with his old friend. He returned to the orphanage, lost in heavy thoughts. How much had Victor endured in the first five years of his life? At this age, children understand a lot, and if his stepfather was beating his mother in front of the child, the boy couldn't help but see it. And if he really killed his wife and Victor witnessed it? Maybe that's why the stepfather decided to get rid of the stepson? However, childhood memory is selective. Sometimes the brain blocks out information that the child doesn't want to remember, as if closing off access to it. Mr. Garcia still managed to learn something, but what to do with this knowledge? Victor is still a teenager, he is not capable of analyzing information with a cold mind. The guard decided not to tell Victor anything for now. Time will tell, and everything will fall into place. It was time to leave the orphanage. Victor had been waiting for this day for two years. Louise and Martin studied in special institutions, they were older and left the orphanage before Victor. Sometimes friends met, walked around the city, but they didn't plan on robbing women in cars anymore. Louise was completely absorbed in her studies. She boasted to Victor about the new clothes she designed and sewed herself. Look at my new dress, she said, spinning around him. Do you think where I bought it? At the market, he asked. Or at the mall. You didn't guess, I made it myself, Louise proudly announced. Wow, you're like a real fashion designer, it's beautiful, Victor said, admiring the girl's beautiful figure in the new outfit. Martin was studying to be a welder. After I finish studying, I'll go to Alaska, he shared his future plans with Victor. I'll work there on rotation, they say they pay good money. The government hasn't given me an apartment yet anyway. If I'm lucky, I'll earn my own housing. Welders are needed everywhere, and they have a high salary. That day, Victor, like the other teenagers, received his certificate. As tradition, the orphanage director called them one by one into her office, took out their personal files, and told them what was known about their origins, parents, and arrival at the orphanage. Only Victor wasn't called, and he stood by the door, waiting to hear his name. When the director came out of the office, he looked at her questioningly. Why are you looking at me like that, Hughes, she embraced him. You know, we know nothing about your family. No one has been looking for you all these years. My advice to you, Victor, start your life with a clean slate, as if nothing ever happened. I'm not an alien to suddenly appear on earth, the boy objected. Someone gave birth to me. That's true, but who, we don't know, even though we tried to find out. The director walked down the corridor, and Victor watched her go. He used to think that adults were hiding some terrible secret from him, some information that could harm him, in their opinion. But now he understood that no one knew anything about him. Victor will spend this summer still in the orphanage. He will only leave when he goes somewhere to study. Where exactly, he hasn't decided yet. The boy sat on the swing, his legs drawn up. The old swing creaked slightly, and that creak brought various thoughts. Mr. Garcia's voice pulled Victor out of his contemplation. Hey, Victor, let's go talk, the guard shouted. The guy got off the swing and headed towards the man's call. The guard's room was dimly lit, with a faint ray penetrating through the dusty glass. There were no children's voices coming from behind the door. Mr. Garcia suggested the boy sit down, and he himself sat opposite. For several days, he had been contemplating how to start a difficult conversation with the boy. The guard was convinced it was time to tell the boy about the strange criminal case recounted by the lieutenant colonel, as it seemed suspicious and could well be connected to Victor's fate. You know, Mr. Garcia began the conversation, I recently heard a story. Just listen, and then decide if you need it or not. 
Mr. Garcia sequentially told the boy about a family with three children, about a woman's body found in an ice hole, about children, initially three of them, but the eldest mysteriously disappeared. The boy listened silently. Suddenly, murky images began to surface in his memory. They seemed to have been stored somewhere in the depths of his mind, and one by one they emerged from the recesses of his memory. There were two little girls wrapped in blankets, crying. There was a woman being beaten by a man. There was a little boy, horror-stricken, watching the beatings from behind a door. All this didn't happen to him, but where did these strange visions come from? Mr. Garcia, do you think this is my family? The boy asked when the guard finished his story. It very well might be, Victor, the man replied. You see, what puzzled me and my friend from the police the most in this story was that the boy went missing. We know about the girls, they finished school, left their father, but what happened to the boy, no one knows. And the timing matches up. The whole story happened in February of that year when we found you at the gates of the orphanage. Do you know where to find this man? Victor decided he had to find out everything himself. I do, Victor, Mr. Garcia replied, but think carefully a hundred times whether you need this. I'm sure I do. The next day, Victor went to the city. In the pocket of his shirt lay the coveted note with the address. The boy hoped that by going there, he would remember something. Perhaps then he would understand what happened to his family and why he ended up in the orphanage. Climbing to the third floor, he knocked on the shabby door. No one answered. He pushed the door, and it opened. He hesitantly entered the apartment. Hello, he called out. Is anyone home? In the silence, Victor walked past the kitchen, peering inside. There was a half-empty bottle of vodka on the table, bread crust scattered around, salt spilled from the wooden salt shaker. Empty bottles lay on the floor, dirt everywhere, and there were no curtains on the windows. The boy walked further down the corridor. In the large room, a man lay on the couch. Unshaven, dressed in dirty, unkempt clothes, he was asleep. Hey, wake up, Victor called out. But the man didn't respond. He showed no signs of life at all. Coming closer, Victor shook him by the shoulder, and the man's head slumped from the pillow. He was dead. Realizing that he had stumbled upon a corpse at the address provided by Mr. Garcia, the boy became frightened. Unsure of what to do, he quickly headed towards the front door. Unexpectedly, a woman appeared on the threshold before him. Her hair was disheveled, her dress wrinkled, and she reeked strongly of alcohol. Who are you, she slurred. Victor didn't know what to say. There's a dead man, he managed to say. What do you mean, a dead man, the woman said with a slurred voice, pushing the boy back into the apartment. He's in there, in the room on the couch, the man. Swaying, the woman walked down the corridor. No, Raphael's just sleeping, he's just drunk, she said, leaning over the man on the couch. Want a drink, she asked Victor. You better touch him, he's cold and not moving, he said, ignoring the stranger's offer. And who are you anyway, she suddenly came to her senses and asked. I'm Victor, I need Raphael, the boy replied. Is this him? Yes, Raphael's mine, my sweetie, the woman grabbed the man's head with both hands, shaking and kissing him on the face. Suddenly, she froze, slowly sinking to the floor next to the couch. Is he dead or something, she whispered softly. Looks like he is, the boy replied. And who are you to him? I'm his wife, the woman quietly wailed, holding her head in her hands. Oh, what's happening, why did you have to die? Realizing he wouldn't get anything useful from this drunk woman, Victor left the apartment and knocked on the neighbor's door. A woman opened it, holding a ladle, and the apartment smelled deliciously of soup. Please, call the police, the boy asked. Your neighbors have a dead body in their apartment. The woman looked carefully at Victor and said, So Raphael died of alcohol, I'll call the police now, wait here, young man. Victor remained standing in the stairwell. When the police arrived, they asked him to stay for questioning, as he was the one who found the body. The neighbor was also questioned. Answering the officer's questions, she kept looking at the unfamiliar boy. He reminded her of someone. 
Tell us your name, said the police officer. Victor Hughes, the boy replied. Suddenly, the neighbor clapped her hands, jumped up from her chair, and ran to the boy. Oh, Lord, Victor, it can't be, is it you, she exclaimed, staring at his face. The neighbor, who had once helped Victor's parents with the young Victor, recognized in the young man the missing child, Jessica's son. They were offered to go to the police station together to sort everything out in detail. From the police station, Victor returned with the neighbor to her apartment. The woman talked to the boy for a long time about his mother, about his short childhood in the family, about the stepfather who brutally beat Jessica, about her suspicions that Raphael killed Victor's mother. Tears streamed down the boy's face. The truth about his life was bitter, but he finally learned it, and his heart felt lighter.